The U.S. through the Helms-Burton law um, has recently has imposed tighter penalties on companies that do business or invest in Cuba um, in light of the downing of the aircraft. Was, was their action justified, do you think? <laughs> Don't get me started on that. Helms-Burton represents an outrageous abuse of power. Absolutely outrageous. How dare any one country in the world think they have the right to punish other countries in their natural economic business and transaction because you are carrying a historical grudge that goes back 30 years? Let us be plain. I re forgive me. I regard the U.S. attitude towards Cuba in the following terms. One, I see it as massive hypocrisy. Why do I say that? Look at China. There is no discernible difference between the state of so-called human rights in the state of the philosophical attitude towards government between the two countries. No distinction. China enjoys most favored nation trading sta status. status. Mm -hmm. Cuba is the object of the most brutal, sustained, unjust sanctions that we have probably ever seen. Secondly, you fight Vietnam. Tens of thousands die. Blood runs. Vietnam is still in terms of social organization, not a part of the U.S. approach. And you're now making friends with them. How do you justify treating Cuba in that way? I don't agree with communism and never have. Contrary to my philosophy, my attitude, my outlook. Even, but even, I, hmm? even when your critics accuse oh, you? My, my critics, frankly, over that, forgive me, are a set of idiots. To the extent they believed that I was communist, reflects their stupidity, their total unwillingness to understand political truth. Should we send back our Cuban refugees? We have no choice. You know, you, you think about it. And what a reflection on some people in Jamaica. Haitians come to Jamaica under economic pressure. And fear of the Tonton Makut. We send them back. Everybody says, Amen. Some Cubans come because there's economic pressure. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, Cuba is in deep trouble, deep, deep trouble. And there's a lot of pressure on the people now with the sanctions, etc. So they come. They pretend to be political refugees. That's not true. They're economic refugees. The independent authorities that look at it are clear. The government rightly said, give us a judgment. They're economic refugees. So we have to send them back if we keep them. I'm not, I don't know why the government took its you know, particular decision, because I'm not in touch. I know what I think. And that is that if you had accepted those refugees, apart from the few who established a case for being political, will you tell me what you would have done with the next 10,000? all coming here to get to Miami? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would we have done with them? Mm -hmm. No, I had to. Mr. Manley, why are Jamaicans so sentimental about Cubans? Um, I think there's a, looked at objectively, you know, there, there's a history to this. Because from one point of view, many people, and quite legitimately, this is absolutely their right, have a very strong anti-communist position. And as they say, enough respect. The, um, and therefore see a lot of what happens, not in terms of the internal reality of Cuba, but of their ideological perception about Cuba, some of which is true, that it is a communist country. It doesn't pretend to be otherwise. So that obviously people come from Cuba, which is now under acute economic pressure and distress. They feel an a psychological impulse 
to support those who come who are by definition anti-communist. So I think this is one factor that one has to understand. But I feel that if you look at the comparison between the attitudes to the Cubans and the Haitians, it tells you a deeper story. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that has happened in Cuba after Batista that can begin to compare with the horror that was Haiti and in many ways still is Haiti, the brutality, the Tonton Makut murdering of people, the slaughtering of people. So that if your judgment flowed from compare Cuba inside to Haiti inside, your sentiment should be even stronger to help the Haitians. Why therefore do they not? Partly because there is not that same ideological coloration to how people see it. And partly, if you'll forgive me, I think there is at least unconsciously a racial factor. Let's look at the Cuban. The Cubans who come here are, you know, white or high brown. And again, no respect. I think I'm a rainbow man myself, believe in full right of everybody equally. But Haitians are seen as black, underprivileged, and no adornment yes. to middle class interests. Yes. Now, a lot of people are going to abuse me for saying that. But the fact is I'll take the abuse because they have to tell me why the difference in the attitude to the, the Haitian and the Cuban. How far in terms of CARICOM have we really, have we, have we come? CARICOM needs rapidly to create a situation where there is genuine freedom for the movement of labor. Genuine freedom for the movement of capital mm -hmm. and an institutional framework that supports that because that's the only way you're going to get your economies of scale and so on and so forth. God knows that's going to be a long enough process as it is because what you have to do is look logically at the factors of production and set up a situation that encourages private sector helped by governments to create our own um, cross-border investment and larger corporations. Yes. That is reality. Without that, NAFTA is not opportunity but threat. With it, you can make NAFTA opportunity. And what you can't do is turn NAFTA back. Mm -hmm. Within 10, 15 years, there is going to be a Western Hemisphere free trade arrangement. You stay out, you're marginalized. Yes. What you have to do is get in without being destroyed. Yes. Is it fair to compare us to, to, the, um, to the Asian tigers, the so-called Singapore, um, Koreas? In many ways it is unfair, yes, because in fact you have to look at a number of factors which are not talked about. One is that in parts of that region at a critical moment after the Second World War, the U.S. moved massive capital into those countries, gave them enormous support. And they did so for strategic political reasons, which, lucky for them, you know, that, that, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. They also had the wisdom to invest very heavily in education. Yes. And that was their doing, and much to their credit. It is argued that they had cultural advantages, which are true, in that is um, social attitudes that were more focused on the imperative of work than on the imperative of social justice. Mm -hmm. The fact is, you know, when you look at what happened, <laughs> democracy was not that real in a lot of those countries so that you had both political process and cultural history working towards less concern with fairness, fair play for the poor and the masses and the workers, mm -hmm. and more getting people Human to accept rights. this driven work, mm -hmm. work ethic. Our problem is that we have not been strategic, therefore we have not attracted huge inputs of government to government capital, because nobody thought that much turned on world politics, you know, at what happened to us. Mm -hmm. We also had the strength, 
born of the reaction to slavery and all sorts of things, of a, a tendency to concern with social justice, equity in the distribution of things, less positive attitudes towards work, yes. which were partly a function of colonialism and partly a sort of historical reaction to a period in history where work was more driven by the orders from above than representing an urge to perform on your own. Yes. So, you know, you have to look at all that history, not to excuse or to remain as you are. But if you don't understand the history, you may not know how to lead people towards the best of which they are capable. Yes. When protectionism means that the powerful countries close their borders against what we could call third world trade, third world attempts to get into their markets, it is of course a disaster. On the other hand, in developing countries and particularly small countries, you have to look at protectionism very analytically because taken too far, it becomes the cause of inefficiency, uh, manufacturing laziness and so on and so forth, and you get inefficient industries. But on the other hand, without an early period when what they're called sensitive industries are protected from competition that they cannot face from the great mass producers, how do you develop? How do you get it going? So protectionism, as I say, is a thing people, you know, it's a word you throw around. Yes. But you have to analyze very carefully what it implies in different situations. What the world really needs is to have an understanding that big countries will open their trading doors to young countries struggling to make it. In the knowledge that uh, every young country that begins to make it will demand many of the things that they produce. In a funny way, it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, to have the intelligence to grant to young countries in a selective and carefully regulated way areas of protection while they are trying to grow. Mm -hmm. If only for their own survival. Well, it in is from our point of view for our survival, but ironically, it is to the good of the developed country also, if they would only have the wisdom to see it in the round and in the long term. Mm -hmm.